First, you adjust the patella. Face forward, go. Alright? So, on general inspection, the patient is standing comfortably, a normal build, and then uh, there's no walking aid around the patient. On closer inspection, if there is any obvious malalignment, any swelling, scar, skin changes, sinus, the blue, any wasting of the quadriceps muscle. Alright? Any obvious deformity that you noted. Then, from the side, just from the side, uh, whether the hip is in flex position, the knee is in flex position or not. Because sometimes, if you've got a hip pathology, uh, it'll be hip fixed flexion deformity, so you'll flex like that. And in order to compensate that, they will, they will have to flex the knee as well. Alright, so you just look at that. And then posteriorly, the same thing. Any posterior, the knee, posterior knee level, are they located at the same line? Posterior knee line, are they located at the same level? Alright. And then the hind foot, you can comment without uh, without commenting if it's fine as well. Alright, so can you walk there and come back? Basically, here for the hip, you are looking for any antalgic gait, any short limb gait, any trendon lumbar gait. Sometimes the three of them can coexist together uh, to make your life very complicated. <laughs> okay, alright. So, after that, as I said, usually my way, I will ask the patient to squat down because it's a lower limb. Alright, can you squat down and come up? Okay, alright, very good. Alright, so next thing, before you lie the patient down, you need to do a trendon lumbar test for hip examination. Very important, alright. So I already showed you guys just now how to do. I am not gonna repeat that. Now can you just slide down here? <coughs> Go back to standard. Look, feel, move. Alright. So you uh for example, I'm gonna examine from the right hip. It's okay. Alright. So you can you just uh, uh roll to yourself to slightly? Okay, alright, good. Just like that. Alright. And then after that, <coughs> you put it down, and after you inspect. Alright, again, closer inspection of the hip joint, any swelling, scar, sinus, skin changes. Alright, uh, any obvious bony deformity noted. Then you feel, feel slowly, uh, around the hip joint, all the way towards the back, along the inguinal ligament, ASIS, anterior hip joint, posterior hip joint. Check for any increase in warmth. Feel is always tenderness and uh, temperature, right? Except the knee, you got more effusion also. Okay, that's feel. Then after that, you're gonna move. All right. So now you can lie back. First, I want to know whether patient has got any fixed flexion deformity or not. And before that, what is a prerequisite to do a Thomas test? Okay, there must be no knee flexion contracture, right? Okay. So when a patient lie down like this. You're not sure whether it's due to the hip fixed flexion deformity or due to the knee fixed flexion deformity. Either way, they're going to lie in this position. Alright, so what you do? You extend the knee. Whether it can extend or not. If it can extend, it's not from the knee. Lah. It's from the hip. So, <clears throat> if it's coming from the knee, alright, then you need to bring the patient down here. What is this test called? Yes, so the original is Thomas test up there. Then after that, if you bring the patient down, if the patient got knee contracture, it's called a modified Thomas test. Okay, so I'm going to slide my hand underneath the patient's lumbar. Look for any uh, lumbar lordosis. As I flex the hip and knee, then I should look for obliteration of the lumbar lordosis. Alright, so for example, now can you flex your knee all the way as much as possible? No, flex. Bring all the way, and then can you help me hold it? Uh, you hold it. You, you so, when you do this movement, you are checking for two things. You are checking for here how much he can flex. Active flexion. You don't know how much yet. Here you don't know how much yet. It start from what? But you know that it is approximately 135 degrees for the hip flexion. Then you look at this side. Any fixed flexion deformity. So you look at two things, huh? Again, you know that the flexion can go up to 135, but you do know what is the starting point. Here, you're looking for any FFD. Okay, so there's no FFD in him. Okay, okay. If you've got FFD, then it will become like this. Then you can determine, okay, patient's right here, got an FFD of about 15 degrees. Right. Then you repeat the same thing. <clears throat> go up all the way and hold. So here, you know that the starting point is zero. Okay? Because there's no FFD. If you've got an FFD, then you comment that 
patient has got an FFD of 30 degree. So the active flexion is from 30 degree to 135 degree. Then now you know where's the end point, 135 degree. Just now was zero. So the active flexion of the right hip is from zero to 135. Okay, understand now, Thomas test. Modified Thomas test, almost the same. Can you just come back, your knee like this? Okay, just slide up. So if patient got knee contracture, you do the same thing. Comment on the same thing. How much is the end point of the knee flexion? Then contralateral side, your FFT. Okay, but don't comment the starting point first until you already check. Okay. <coughs> okay, now you go back up. <coughs> so just now you check about hip flexion already. Hip extension, we rarely check one. It's just like shoulder adduction. We usually just forget about it. Not to not say forget it. It's also important. Right. And uh, rarely pathologies will affect that as well. Right. You, because if you were to have any hip pathology, it's going to be a uh, fixed flexion deformity, fixed flexion contracture. There's no like, extension contracture and so on. So. Alright, so after that, you do internal and external rotation. Alright, so go up, flex, flex. This is what? External rotation. So about 30 degrees. Alright, and internal rotation, usually about 45 degrees like that. Alright, so that's normal. Alright. The reason that why I do all this first because the next test is abduction and adduction, which will require you to square the pelvis. In a hip examination, there are three points of time whereby you need to square the pelvis. Number one, when you are doing a hip abduction and adduction range of motion. Number two, Galeazi test. Number three, when you want to measure the limb length. Three points of time during hip examination, you need to square the pelvis. Alright, so now I will square the pelvis. How do I identify the ASIS? Standard approach, the standard way. You, If you say, oh, I'll copy the ASIS. Yeah, like, I mean like that's a, a average student, but you guys need to be excellent. So, palpate from the pubic symphysis along the inguinal ligament, the first bony hard point that you palpate, that is your ASIS. That is what you should mention. How do you identify ASIS? Alright, so starting from the pubic symphysis, at the side here is a pubic tubercle, along the inguinal ligament, the first hard point or bony hard point is your ASIS. Alright, so you see the pelvis, square the pelvis, make sure coming from the top, it is symmetrical. Alright, and then after that, roughly like this, alright, stabilize it, especially if uh, children, then you can uh, Straight away can pop it both. Otherwise, you just roughly stabilize it. And then after that, you do your abduction. How much? 0 to 45 degree. Okay, alright. That's adduction. Adduction, I do like this. Some people just cross. But I feel that if we, I just cross, there's a, a component of flexion as well. Because you flex only, then you cross. So another way to do is what I do is like this. Okay, but make sure it doesn't rotate. Yeah. Okay, alright. And the other side also doesn't rotate. So now you've got your range of motion all done ready. Okay, alright. So now the next thing is that um, look, feel, move. And uh, what else? Oh, uh, usually limb length. Lah. Usually they will have limb length. Huh? For example, AVN of the uh, uh, hip and all that. So then you do your Galeazi test. Similarly, make sure the pelvis is square and then you flex the patient's knee 90 degree. The most important thing here is the heel at the same level. The heel must be at the same level. Sometimes they may not be able to flex. Yeah, so then you make sure the heel are at the same level. That's a prerequisite. Okay. The heel by right 90 degree. Heel at the same level. Alright. So how do you interpret this Galeazi test? One from the end here, one from the top there. Alright, so when you place your hand on top of the femur, okay, you are looking at the tibia. Okay, so for example, if if let's say the heel are actually at the same level, now I place my hand on the femur, so you can see that there's an obvious shortening of the tibia. They're coming from here, you place your hand on the femur, but the limb length discrepancy is coming from the tibia. Now on the other side. Provided that this is the same level, uh, I just want to demonstrate to you. If here at the same level, tibia here will be at the same level. Both will be like this. Same level, here at the same level. When you place your hand on the tibia, you are looking at the femur. 
So you can see that there's an obvious shortening of the right femur. Okay, all right, understand Galeaji test. So besides Galeaji test, there are other tests whereby you can see whether it's coming from femur or tibia. One thing is called Godfrey's test. Heard before? Sex both. Like this. Then after that, you see which one protrudes more. Mm. Mm. This is a G O D F F R E one. Got three steps. You can see that. All right. So here, if longer, then you know already, lah. Okay. All right. So got three steps, and then after that, you're gonna measure the uh, limb length, and then determine where does it arise from. Hmm. Okay. Um. Mm, okay. So again, you uh, square the pelvis. Copy the ASIS and then after that go all the way up to the medial malleolus. I would suggest you mark it. Mark it. Medial joint line here, mark it. And then the palpate. And then after that do a segmenter. Uh, see where does it arise from. Okay. So let's say if it arises from the femur. Alright. Now the next thing you want to do whether it's infratrochanteric or supratrochanteric. So what do you do? Okay. So Brian's triangle, first you identify the ASIS, then you rotate. Identify your GT. Uh, this is his GT lah, the bony formula. Uh, this is a GT. Then after that, you mark, you mark, use a pen, mark, mark, and then after that, the line, then you mark another vertical line down. Okay? Then the distance between this point and this point. And then compare to the other side. Uh, and then uh, depends whether it tally with your this one or not. Because sometimes it may, for example, if you've got a neck of femur fracture, and then with the ipsilateral femur shaft fracture, it could be both sides. A shortening, maybe supra to and in front to So just try to tally with your measurement. That way it's correct or not. Um, <coughs> Alright, so after that, usually up to this point, then I'll complete it with the uh, neurovascular examination of the lower limb. But just a very screen thrown it. L2, L3, L4, L5, S1, or pit DPA, PTA. That's all. So possible causes of Trendelenburg gait or Trendelenburg sign include could be either from the hip joint there, <coughs> could be at the neck there, or could be the muscle, could be any of this. All right, if it's at the hip joint, developmental dysplasia of the hip, DDH, or adult hip dysplasia. Okay, you can see that. <coughs> and then second, if it's concerning about the uh, neck, malunion neck of femur fracture, or coxa vera. Why called Salvera? Because you see, this is your abductor muscle, gluteus, medius, and minimus. All right. <clears throat> Normal angle here is about hundred and twenty-five degree, plus minus five degree. So, when this one is like that, okay lah, the tension is good. But when you have a coxa vera, it means like this. Less than 125 degree. This degree. So now it's probably about 110 degree. Alright. So, now, <coughs> the muscle is still the same length, but the space is less. So it becomes lax really. Understand? So it's some sort of like a, become muscle weakness like that. Mm. Neck of a um, mal union of the neck of femur is because of that also. Because when they mal unite, they usually mal united in such a manner that it goes into coxa vera. Mm. So your abductor muscle becomes weak. Mm. So you have a channel number sign positive. And then these are just how I talk about the hip pathology that can lead to channel number, neck pathology that can lead to channel number. The last one is superior gluteal nerve injury because your superior gluteal nerve supplies your Adductor muscle. Alright. Can I any other question? Final few minutes. Any question? I want to clarify. Oh Joseph, can you talk about some differentials of hip hip pain? Yeah, definitely. So first of all, primary hip OA. Alright. Second, secondary hip OA. For example, secondary to inflammatory arthritis. Can be Sero positive, sero negative. Sero positive is your rheumatoid arthritis. Sero negative is your uh, 
uh, reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, all these are seronegative. Can be due to metabolic disorder, for example, gouty arthritis, pseudo gout arthritis. Okay, so you've got primary, you've got secondary. The third one, you put AVN of the hip. AVN usually can be due to direct or indirect causes. Uh. Direct causes are, for example, your trauma, irradiation, hmm? Kaizen's disease, all right, and the sickle cell for direct. Indirect causes due to your alcoholism and steroids use. All right, so AVN and then anything else, huh? let me see. Probably uh, definitely got a referred pain from the lumbar sacral spine. Um, yeah. For sciatica, can we share with our diagnosis of sciatica? Uh, usually, in our postgraduate so far, we never put our impression as sciatica. Lah. So usually it's like a... a for lumbar spine, lumbar spinal stenosis or instability pain or usually patients have got an L5 or L4, L5 radiculopathy and those are our uh, first diagnosis and then after that our differential diagnosis can be like referred pain from the hip uh, uh, this kind of stuff so only after that you talk about causes of lumbar spinal stenosis just like your cervical myelopathy uh, that's your provisional diagnosis then you talk about other secondary first now after that, you talk about causes of lumbar spinal stenosis. Can be trauma, infection, tumor, and degenerative causes. Uh, for straight leg raise test, uh, is it different angle got different causes, or is just positive or negative? Um, uh, not really, but rather thirty-five to seventy degrees. Uh, that is where your arbory of the sciatic nerve is. Uh, is the most tense. All right. So if it's more than that, it could be due to hamstring tightness. More than 70 degrees, if the patient got pain, it can be due to because very tight already, hamstring, they can't go more. And if it's a 0 to 35 degrees, and they already started to feel pain, it's unlikely to be due to this uh, sciatica. Why? Because the slackness of the sciatic nerve has not been taken up yet. Understand? It's still quite slack and all that. So it's not in tension yet. So if it's already got pain, then probably you think of a sacroiliitis or a hip joint pathology and so on.